A vent-driven architecture is great for loose coupling between services, but like everything, it has its own set of challenges and complexity, specifically troubleshooting. I'm gonna cover and deep dive into Wix.com, a recent post that they had, where troubleshooting with Kafka in over 2,000 microservices and their event-driven architecture. While that may not be to your scale, you will experience the same type of issues that they had in troubleshooting if you're using an event-driven architecture and or Kafka. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So this is a blog post on Medium by a developer at Wix.com, Nathan Selinski, and he's posted one before. I'll have a link to this one and the other one that I've covered as well about kind of the gotchas of EDA. But I love these posts and I can't believe I didn't notice it earlier. This goes back from December, but I'm gonna kind of cover all the things that they mention in here. And some of them are specific to EDA, event driven architecture, and then some of them are more specific to Kafka. So I'm gonna kind of contrast and compare a little bit if you're using Kafka and maybe more of a traditional queue-based broker. So here's the post, I'll have a link in the description. Let's get into it. When it comes to an event driven architecture, easily the most common question or issue or concern is related to tracing and understanding the flow of events, especially if you're using event choreography. So as they kind of illustrate here, is that they have a simplified example. Let's say we have the ordering service and a payment service and an inventory service. So the ordering service publishes an order create event, which payment has to pick up. And then it processes the payment and it has a payment com completed, which then the inventory service has to pick up. So this is event choreography. This is great, but how do you visualize that it actually completed this business process, though you think, or it happens if something failed? You really have no easy way of visualizing this. But over the last several years, this has been a lot easier to do with open telemetry, the underlying libraries that you're using for messaging, for your event driven architecture, for them to be outputting open telemetry data that you can then export into something like Zipkin that I'm about to show. So this has become a lot easier. The problem is if you're like Wix.com and you have 2000 microservices, they all need to be using open telemetry and all be propagating these um, IDs, event IDs, correlation IDs that actually can give you this output that you can see. So what I did is I created a sample application that kind of mimics the same type of thing. I had a sales boundary, billing for doing the payments and shipping for creating a shipping label. And just to illustrate how this worked. So in ASP.NET Core, I had that original request. We can see it coming in here, how long it took. I was debugging. You can see my host information, what the URI was. And the next thing I did from that was I actually created a message that I was sending to sales to place the actual order. So we can say this is my sales destination. It was going to an actual queue. From there, we can see me actually processing in sales. I was processing that message. And interestingly enough, when you're using other tooling, again, depending on the platform that you're in, using, here I was actually using uh, SQL Express, and we can actually see the actual queries that were being made to it, a part of that request within sales. So I can actually see um, the insert statement that was being done, the timing, everything related to it. At this point, I then placed a, uh, I published an order place event. So we can see that I'm sending that to a topic for a particular destination, and this just keeps going through. We can go see that we go from sales, then billing's the one that picks that up. Sales actually got it back, because I was doing some orchestration here. I then sent it back, um, that event got processed by shipping, my shipping boundary. And then what I did here, just as an illustration, because I was making an HTTP call to fedex.com, say I was creating a shipping label, we can actually see that request being made as well. So it's not even just events, but the the, the beauty of this is even internally within a particular boundary, how it's processing a request, maybe it's using a database, maybe it's using um, HTTP, you can have all of this a part of a full trace. So kind of the issue of 10 years ago of kind of visualizing kind of venture of an architecture and all these things within a distributed application are simplified with using something like open telemetry. But again, as mentioned, that means that all services need to be using it for you to actually get a meaningful trace. And if you have an existing, large existing application, that's something you need to contend with is implementing it pretty much everywhere. So the second aspect of troubleshooting really piggybacks off the first here is just understanding the events, the payloads of those events 
in their case with Kafka in a stream and them saying, okay, well, we're using UI for Apache Kafka, the Confluent Control Center, Conductor, and ultimately creating something themselves so that they can see kind of that stream of events in a particular topic. Now, this is incredibly common. Wix.com went the route as well as creating something on their own to kind of visualize the events in Kafka. But if you're not using Kafka and you are using something else, some more maybe a typical queue-based broker, there are different options. It just really depends on what you're using. So it is almost kind of a solved problem, but it's gonna be dependent on the underlying tooling that you're using. Again, look at kind of the messaging libraries that you're using, which I always advocate for, because they often provide some type of UI as well. So there's a few other points in this post that kind of relate to each other. The, the other one here is just how do you investigate slow consumers and what the root cause is? Now, the first thing to touch on is just metrics. The fact that they had an alarm that basically they were producing more events than they could consume. So they have an alarm on this. How do you do that? You need metrics. So that's kind of my first point is understanding the length of time it takes you to actually consume a message, how long it's sitting there, kind of that throughput rate of, are you producing more messages that you can consume? And that's what really their alarm was, is that they were producing more message than they could consume in a 30 minute period. And this is awesome so that you don't end up with this really this backlog or consumer lag, because if that continues and you're producing more than you can consume, you'll never catch up. So the first thing really is just having really good metrics in place so you can understand when you're kind of going offside. So why would consumer lag happen specifically in Kafka? Because I want to talk about this because I think it's an issue also mentioned in this blog post that happens quite often with Kafka. So we're saying that we're going to get consumer lag when we're producing events and we're adding events to our topic, we're appending those to our topic faster then our consumers can actually process them. So let's say we had 10 messages coming in a second and we're only able to produce five, well, we're not gonna be able to keep up. And especially over the long haul here. So if you kind of have down periods, then obviously you can catch up. Hence why their alarm was on 30 minutes. So the thing is with Kafka specifically and why a lot of people leverage it is because of ordering. Messages are gonna be consumed and processed in order by a consumer within a consumer group for a given partition. That means that you have a consumer group, I hear have on the, on the right, there's two consumers within that group, P1 and P2. Now, I, the way I have this set up is that the first consumer, P1, it's only gonna process the events within the partition, the single, the one partition. One partition can only have a single consumer within a group. That's what allows you to process them in order. So that means that, well, let's say I have a message, I place that on partition one within our particular topic. And then I have another message and I place that on partition two. Well, my, the consumer that I've assigned to that partition is the first one, it's gonna process that message. And then the other message can be processed concurrently by a separate consumer. Cause we've, again, you can only have one consumer in a group uh, per partition. So that means that if I have another message come in to that first partition, once uh, that consumer P1 has finished processing that other uh, message, it can then process the secondary message that comes in. It's gonna do them in order. If another message comes in to P1 and another message comes in, gets appended to that particular topic in that particular partition, we have to wait until we P1 is finished before it can consume another message. It's gonna do them in order. Now you can have a consumer within a consumer group be responsible for more than one partition. But again, the key here is when you're thinking about a partition, it only has one consumer within a group. Why does that matter? Well, it does give you the benefit of being able to process messages in order, but you don't really have the competing consumers pattern that you would with a typical queue-based broker. Because if your uh, throughput is going down the crapper because you're producing more than you consume, you could just keep adding consumers and you can process messages concurrently. This is only applicable to Kafka depending on what your partition strategy is. So you just need to be really aware of what you're, how you're partitioning. And if all of a sudden you have just say a single partition that you're flooding um, with uh, your pending events to that topic, to that specific partition, you really only have one consumer that is actually gonna, within the group, that's actually gonna process it. So you don't really have competing consumers in the same way because you're broken down to partition. The benefit is you're processing them in order. 
So just be aware of kind of, of that benefit and its limitation. So the last thing I wanna to touch on here, really about failures, but again, this is specific to Kafka, is how you could potentially skip an event, meaning that in their case, they have an event that's taking a long time to consume because some rogue event with some huge payload, we don't know what to do with it. How would you deal with that? Well, in Kafka, you need to kind of move that offset of where you're at to skip it so that you kind of skip that event and start processing everything after that point. Now, if you're using a typical Cubase broker, what would you do? Well, it's pretty obvious. So there's patterns for this already. You would just use a dead letter queue. You would have your consumer, oh, I can't deal with this. I have retry mechanisms. I have timeouts. After that timeout, as the example, well, I'm just gonna move that to um, the dead letter queue and I'm just gonna continue on processing because that message then is removed from that queue. But with Kafka, you don't really have this. You have to come up with different scenarios on how you're gonna manage kind of these failures or skipping a particular message. Now there's obviously strategies, you'll see talk about kind of dead letter topics for this kind of scenario and different ways people deal with it. But it really goes back to, again, the idea that you have a single consumer within a group that's responsible for a partition. And you can't just scale out and add more consumers within a group. Because you're dealing with that message, you have to process that event within that partition before you continue on. And if you can't continue on, then you need to skip it and then realize in some meaningful way that you may need to reprocess it or investigate why you can't process that message. But here's the caveat. If you're doing things in order because that's what you're leveraging partitions for, can you really skip the message? So things get really fuzzy here. I wanna give a shout out to Nate at Wix.com for posting this just as he did his other posts. I think it's really valuable for just developer community as a whole for seeing these types of things kind of understanding kind of the problems, this one specifically with troubleshooting that a lot of people will run into. Hopefully this video provided a little bit more insight and if it did, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to chat with other software developers about software architecture and design and topics like this, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. The link's in the description on how to join. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.